Welcome to Plant Rights Invasive Plant Webinar. My name is Matt Bovell. I'm going to be your technical moderator for this evening. We are using the Omnovia system to power our webinar, and the most important thing that you should know about it is how to ask questions. If you look at the chat box at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a place where you can type questions, and our presenters will answer those questions at the end of the webinar. If you encounter any technical difficulties viewing or hearing the webinar, please type your concern in the chat box and I will try to resolve your problem. So without further ado, here is your host for today's webinar, Greg Richardson. All right. Well, thank you, Matt, and thank you to everybody for joining us today, and welcome to the 2011 Invasive Plant Webinar. My name is Greg Richardson, and I am a project associate working on the Plant Right campaign. Uh, the goals for today are to inform you more about the topic of invasive species, and specifically invasive horticultural plants, and to tell you more about the Plant Right campaign and the work that we're doing um, through our 2011 Spring Nursery Survey. Now, if you are interested in joining us for the survey, uh, one of the things that I'd like to tell you is that we're going to first ask you to take a five-question quiz on the content of this webinar uh, before participating. So if uh, you'd like to, you can take notes. You, it probably will not be necessary, um, but just fair warning. And also, uh, this webinar is being recorded. So uh, if you're joining us through the recording, welcome. So the first thing that I'd like to do with you today is tell you more about uh, what our plan is for the webinar. The first thing I'm going to do is walk you through the Plant Right campaign, tell you more about what it is, uh, why it was started, and how we got to the stage of hosting a nursery survey and webinar on invasive plants. Then we are lucky to have Dan Glusenkamp, who will be uh, giving his fast times on Planet Earth presentation. Um, he's our feature presentation er, presenter, and I'll uh, give his bio here in a couple of minutes. And then the third thing that we'll do is take an intermission. And so that will give you an opportunity to get up, uh, get a glass of water, use the restroom, whatever you choose to do. And then I will come back on uh, for the fourth part of the, sur or of the webinar to tell you more about the spring nursery survey, uh, how you can get involved, and what participation entails. So that is our uh, webinar. And uh, if you have any questions, please ask us questions um, through that chat box at the bottom, like Matt had said. And then we'll have a 20-minute section for question and answer at the end. So the first thing that I'd actually like to do is hear a little bit more about what kind of experiences you've had with invasive plants in the past. So uh, a poll should be coming up onto your screen. And there are a set of different uh, questions that you can answer. So I'll just give it a, a second for that poll to pop up. And so uh, please let us know uh, if you've heard about uh, invasive plants through the media, if you've seen them in natural areas, uh, what kind of experiences you've had. And this is a good opportunity to kind of let you know if you're not familiar with the topic of, inv of invasive plants, what they are. So you can define invasive plants as being any plant that does not naturally occur in a specific area, but whose introduction does or is likely to cause environmental or economic impact and harm or harm to human health. And I should note that you can really click as many of these options as apply to you. And if you are clicking other, um, it would just be interesting to hear what kind of other experiences you've had. So uh, please feel free to type that into the chat box and let us know. So I'll give you about uh, five more seconds here to fill it in. If, uh, if you're not done already, it looks like most people have already uh, punched in their answers. All right, and so I am going to stop the poll in three, two, and one. All right, well, it looks like the the most number of people have seen invasive plants in natural areas, which is uh, really good news for me because it sounds like a lot of us are familiar with this topic and the invasive plants that grow in your region. Um, a number of you have heard about invasive plants through the media, and uh, it's actually been really nice that this topic has been getting increased media attention as time has gone on. Uh, number three, uh, many of you have actually seen them in plant nurseries, and that's really why we're here is we're conducting this uh, and I guess that's why the Plant Right campaign was started, was because of the introduction of invasive plants through the horticultural trade. 
Um, kudos to those of you, the 34 of you, who have participated in a removal of invasive plants. That's really hard work and very important. And then we have a number of people who have been uh, typing into the chat box uh, what kind of other experiences they've had. So it looks like Kathy Sturdivant, uh, before she knew about uh, natives, hold on, we got, uh, I'm getting punched down as people continue to type in uh, their notes. Uh, she purchased and installed two 24-inch box Chinese tallow trees, etc. So there are a number of different experiences we, that we've had. Um, and if this is a new experience for you, or if you have not interfaced with invasive plants in the past, I hope that this can, uh, this webinar can serve as a good introduction. So the first thing that I'd like to do before I start telling you about plant right is to tell you about the nonprofit organization that oversees the plant right campaign. Uh, Sustainable Conservation was founded in 1993, and it partners with the private sector to find environmental solutions that make economic sense. And so the strength of this organization really lies in its ability to partner with the private sector, um, including businesses, agriculture, and actually even government, um, and in establishing models for environmental and economic sustainability that can be replicated across California and beyond. So uh, it's this kind of collaborative approach that takes environmental and economic considerations into account that defines the projects that sustainable conservation works on each of which fall under one of the four categories below. So uh, th those are climate change, clean air, clean water, and biodiversity. And Plant Right is one of the projects that Sustainable Conservation works on to promote and preserve California's biodiversity. And the goal of Plant Right, as many of you are probably aware, is to prevent further introduction of invasive plants into California through our nursery and horticultural trade. So this is just a really brief, um, quick introduction to this topic, but really the point that I, need, I, I wanna make here is that invasive plants have a significant impact on our economy and our environment. And uh, they can increase wildfires um, or the severity of wildfires in and around neighborhoods and natural areas. They can increase area flooding in the winter, dry up streams in the summer, disturb natural soil composition, etc and generally just outcompete the native plants, thereby affecting the animals and ecosystems that depended on them for survival. And so what's really of concern to us today is that many of these plants are still being sold through California's nursery trade. And so in 2005, Sustainable Conservation brought together everybody that works with garden plants and wildlands in California. Um, and this includes leaders from the nursery industry, environmental groups, government agencies, and the scientific and academic community. Uh, and we did this to develop a practical and balanced solution to the introduction of invasive plants through gardens and landscaping. And so uh, what came of this is our plant right campaign that is a voluntary program that encourages collaboration, promotes buy-in from all the affected parties, and uh, avoids potentially burdensome regulation and litigation. And so the first critical question that uh, this group had to answer, and this group eventually became our steering committee, was what garden plants are invasive in California? And what we quickly realized is that a plant invading the desert area of our state is not likely to be a problem in the rainy forests of the North Coast. And so we divided the state into five key regions based on the sunset zones uh, that are found in the Western Garden Handbook. And so what I'm gonna show you here is actually the first of two pages of the 19 invasive plants that our steering committee identified as being highly invasive and that we would like the nursery industry to stop selling. So uh, don't worry about copying down these names. We're not gonna quiz you on them. Um, I'm gonna, we're actually gonna come back to this again. So I'm gonna quickly just jump ahead, but you can see that we've organized it so that the grasses are on top and the ground covers and vines are on bottom. And then here we have shrubs on the top two rows and trees on the bottom row. And so once we established this list, one of the things that we realized was that we were still you know, somewhat in the dark about the frequency and volume at which these plants were, were being traded uh, for gardening. And so what we determined was that it would be really valuable for us to collect data on this because it wasn't being collected by anybody else. And this is really what inspired our spring nursery survey. Uh, so we're doing this uh, not only to track the retail market for invasive plants over time, but this also gives us a good gauge as to the effectiveness of our efforts through our outreach and education um, campaigns, as well as 
uh, it helps to inform our strategy once we have this information going forward in pulling these plants or helping working with the nursery industry to pull these plants off their shelves. So when we started this uh, nursery industry, we teamed up with the UC Master Gardener program, and we're really happy to have uh, such a strong partnership with them. And uh, where there were gaps in our coverage, we were really fortunate to have the help of other plant enthusiasts and conservation groups. And so we're really grateful for the time and the um, partnership of these groups. And so as part of our appreciation, we have invited Dr. Daniel Glusenkamp to join us today. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Glusenkamp. So Dr. Glusenkamp is a founder and past president of the California Invasive Plant Council and a co-founder of both the Bay Area Early Detection Network and the California Early Detection Network. Since 2001, he has worked as director of habitat protection and restoration for Audubon Canyon Ranch's 28 properties. He leads in development, implementation, and evaluation of restoration projects including oversight of stewardship activities and regional collaboration with other agencies to protect Audubon Canyon Ranch lands. His recent research projects have focused on the ecological impacts of introduced turkeys, effects of nitrogen deposition on vernal pools, and novel approaches for predicting invasiveness. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Daniel Glusenkamp, and I'll just give him a second to, uh, to settle in here. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. I'm excited to talk to you about biological invasions. Let me load up the presentation here. There we go. So here we have a photo of Cape Ivy on the central California coast around Big Sur. And I feel like this is a decent plant to start with um, because I feel like it's following me. Um, it's when I, when I got interested in biological invasions in invasive plants in the very early 90s in San Francisco, Cape Ivy was beginning to spread uh, pretty terribly in San Francisco and to cover up some really important natural areas in the Presidio and elsewhere. And at that point, um, it was really just a San Francisco plant. There was a little bit here and there uh, outside of San Francisco, but we thought it was restricted to the fog zone. Um, and we were very happy for that. We were glad that it wasn't going to get into Southern California, the Sierra, elsewhere. Um, over time, um, I, we all found out that we were wrong. I found an occurrence down in uh, northern Baja, California. Um, it's taken over my hometown of Fallbrook, California. And this is one of the plants that I manage for Audubon Canyon Ranch um, to protect the biodiversity of our sanctuaries. So Audubon Canyon Ranch is a system of nature preserves in Marin and Sonoma County. We protect 25 properties as wildlife sanctuaries and education centers. And, and one of our primary objectives is to preserve the biodiversity that was really the reason we protected these lands. And once you've protected lands, you've removed the greatest threat to biodiversity, and, you're, and you suddenly have to face the second greatest threat, biological invasions. And I talk about biological invasions rather than just weeds, because I really want to emphasize that it's part of an overall phenomenon. It's probably the most, I really think it's the most interesting thing happening on our planet today, although there's some crazy things going on in human civilization that's kind of neat. Um, but as far as the natural world is concerned, it's never seen anything quite like this. Um, and just to give you a little overview of, of, of what, what the biological invasion crisis is all about, um, I want to roll back the clock a little bit to when planet Earth had basically one continent, um, a supercontinent with a concomitant low biological diversity. We had the biodiversity that you get on one continent. And over uh, 100 million years or so, a little bit more, continental drift pulled the, pulled the continents apart. And this is, the, this is the world that we've inherited, an amazingly rich, diverse, complicated planet with something like five zoogeographic realms. These are Wallace's zoogeographic realms shown here, essentially different planets of diversity. And this is, in looking at this, this is what caused Charles Darwin to come up with the theory of evolution by natural selection. So this is the world that we've inherited with great diversity, with, with um, duck-billed platypuses in Australia and bighorn sheep in California and flightless birds here and there, um, a really fascinating planet that we all love. Here's a little bit of the diversity that we have. Um, by having several different continents, each with their own evolutionary histories, we've, we've developed things along similar storylines. We've had a little bit of you know, what you might consider redundancy. You can see the two yellow flowered plants there are basically the same plant, but 
but they're from very different evolutionary lineages. In the upper left, it's a California tar plant, native to California, a late summer blooming annual composite plant um, that is, had a great radiation when California began drying uh, six million years or so ago. Um, and we've got tar plants that occur on all kinds of soil types. Some of them are very abundant and are considered weedy. Some of them are endangered. Below that, we have Centoria. That's a yellow star thistle, which is essentially Europe's tar plant, a late summer blooming annual composite plant um, that radiated when Europe began drying um, with, with, with um, star thistles that occur on all kinds of soil types, some of them endangered, some of them weedy. On the other side, we have grasses that did the same thing. The upper right is Melica, which is a California genus, and a little bit outside California, that radiated in California around the same time as Earharta, below the Melica. All these, these things, these are pairs of plants which in the field look very similar. Ecologically, they're very similar. There's something of a redundancy, um, but this is what a lot of us treasure that we really love. Uh, it's the diversity that we've inherited. And when you, when you move these things from one continent to another, then you start getting into trouble. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're basically reconnecting the continents. We're reconnecting Pangaea with our transport. We're moving things at a fantastic rate. A lot of people are moving around at very high speeds. And what you see here is a picture of GPS units, uh, geographical positioning systems, that were put on some cargo ships. Just a bunch of cargo ships, not all of them, for a while, not for that long. They just wanted to get some traces so that they could see where ships were and do some modeling for oil spills. And what it, another side effect of this is that it gave us this great graphic showing us how humans are reconnecting the continents. And each of those things had some organisms on it, some intended and some unintended. And that's how we're causing a biological invasion crisis. We're just moving things around at a high rate, reconnecting the, the zoogeographic realms, changing evolutionary history forever. You can never rewind the clock once you've moved those things around. And for the most part, the things we move around are, are wondrous. Um, we have amazing foods. Um, even when we accidentally introduce something, it's usually not a problem. But there are cases where it is a problem. And in this slide, you see some of those examples. Um, some of these are plants that are ruining farmers' livelihoods in India. Some of them are birds that are eating invertebrates in California. Um, I threw the possum in there. It's a, it's an, it's a North American invader. Um, that interestingly enough, actually, apparently its feces contains, not only is it eating birds out of their nests, but its feces contains a protozoa that's really harming sea otters. So these are the kind of things that we're causing, biological invasions, there's, and, and of course there's sudden oak death in there. So it's not just plants, it's not just animals, but it's microbes, all kinds of things. And as a biologist who takes care of nature preserves, um, one of my primary concerns is that it's ruining the biodiversity, that biological invasions are causing harm to the biological diversity that we love. And this is a shot of some of Audubon Canyon Ranch's lands, the Thomas Point Sanctuary on Tomales Bay. And in the big picture, you can see what the dunes look like um, uh, before we started restoration work. In the inset picture, you see what they're supposed to look like. Um, these dunes, w before we started restoration work, were dominated by European beach grass. Um, which was planted to stabilize dunes. It's very effective at what it does. And 50 years ago, we thought that was a great idea. Today, we realize that it's driving things extinct, that we need to remove the beach grass to restore the natural dynamics of these dune systems and allow them to be home to these interesting and unusual California plants once again. Another example is sudden oak death. A lot of you are probably aware of sudden oak death and how it's really threatening to just fundamentally transform our forest, to remove whole species. Um, and, and just change the function of the systems. So that's a disease with, that we've introduced that we're just beginning to cope with. Um, another disease that's affecting things we care about is West Nile virus. And I show this slide of a, of a yellow-billed magpie, which is really a California species. It's found in California, in the, the Great Valleys of California. It occurs nowhere else. It's hyper-social, hyper-intelligent. Any, if anything can live with humans, it's an animal like this one. Um, but unfortunately, it can't live with West Nile virus, which is an organism we introduced by accident that thrives um, in the Central Valley, in the great valleys that these birds live in. Um, and unfortunately, the birds are extremely susceptible to it. So we're seeing populations decline rapidly as an accident. No one wants to lose this fantastic bird. There's a million bird lovers who would do anything to save it. And, uh, and there's just a limit to what we can do. And, and then I think this might be the last slide of the, of the, of the sad stuff to show you. Uh, this is a farm I visited, a, a teak plantation in India, in Kerala. And, and this man is showing, uh, showed me, the inset photo shows what it's supposed to look like 
20 years after you've planted the teak. Uh, you've got a good teak forest with some biodiversity in it and some valuable plants that can support some livelihoods. Um, when you have several invasive plants move in, you get a forest like the one he's standing in. So he was showing me um, why they're upset about this suite of plants that they have there. So anyway, so that's the bad news. The worst news is that not only are we introducing stuff, we're introducing more stuff faster. The rate is increasing. And this is alien plants in California. Not all of them are harmful. Not all of them are invasive. It's just how many plants, um, how many non-native plants are in the California flora from the earliest records to something somewhere around five years ago. I haven't really updated it, but the trend is the same. So we're introducing things faster. Um, there's a lot of us moving around rapidly, and, um, and there's side effects to that that we don't really like. And we've kind of seen this story before. We saw it when the great cities of Europe emerged. In the 1850s, um, great cities began forming as folks, well, they began forming more before the 1850s. Um, but it wasn't until the 1850s that folks began to realize that great cities didn't necessarily have to suffer from great epidemics. Until 1850 or so, it was just accepted that great cities had great epidemics. It's just how, it, how things were. Um, until during a particularly bad cholera epidemic in London in 1850, I believe, Dr. John Snow put together a little map and he drew a black box everywhere someone had died of cholera in this epidemic. He found that the black boxes seemed to cluster around the Broad Street well. So he went to the town burgers and tried to convince them to shut down the well. And they said, no way, no. You know, everyone knows that cholera is transmitted by dirty air. Um, bug off. He made himself a nuisance, finally got them to take the handle off the well, and the epidemic burned out. They dug up the well, and they found that everyone's, everyone's that at least many septic tanks plumbed right into the well. So people were crapping it out, drinking it up, doing that kind of stuff. Everyone was getting sick. They realized a bunch of things. Um, uh, they realized a bunch of things. Number one, they needed to have better plumbing. Um, but more, more relevant to what we're talking about now, they realized that they could stop outbreaking harmful biological invaders from harming humans by doing a couple things. Hygiene. Simple hygiene. Don't spread stuff around that's going to harm you. And secondly, epidemiology. Figure out what the problem is, map it to figure out where it is, and get it, solve it, before it becomes too bad. And this has saved humans. Today, we live in great cities some, the, on a scale that we've never imagined, with fantastic rates of transportation and amazing population density, and we have, the lowest disease, we have the lowest disease burden of human history. Um, these are tools that have saved us and allowed us to live in an amazingly exciting, complicated, diverse world. It's the kind of stuff that we can apply to protect natural systems so that we can live in an amazing, complicated, diverse social world and natural world. So that's what I'm going to talk about for the next chunk of this. What we do to solve the biological invasion crisis. And the tools are on hand. We know how to use them. We use them to protect human health. And we're beginning to use them to protect natural systems. So these, this is a, a difficult to read screenshot of the recommendations produced by the Ecological Society of America, the largest, most respected professional society of ecologists on planet Earth. They did a white paper on biological invasions and came up with simple recommendations. And you can see these recommendations everywhere else. They're repeated in white paper, after strategic plan, after um, scientific document. They're always more or less the same. And they're the same that we do, they're the same things that we do to protect human health from outbreaking invasive organisms. Number one, you have exclusion. You prevent things from getting in in the first place. You prevent those harmful organisms from getting established. Number two, you have early detection and eradication of things. Um, before they get out of control, before they harm the patient, while it's still possible to eradicate them, um, while the while the cost effectiveness is very high, um, this is this is like the, you know the recent effort to prevent swine flu from sweeping across the country. Um, you try and get on these things early. When prevention has failed and early detection has failed, then you've got something that you got to manage, and this is something like you know chronic infectious diseases that we all have. We have. There's a whole bunch that we all get every winter. Um, you manage them. You try not to spread it. Uh, you drink your fluids. In natural systems, we need to identify when a, an outbreaking invasive organism is causing harm, and we need to figure out what has to be done to manage it so that it doesn't harm the thing we care about. Whether that thing we care about is food production, um, uh, biological diversity, endangered species, um, operational roadsides, fire hazard, whatever it is. And then, of course, through all of this, we need to do public education so that the folk, that 
so that everyone understands what's going on, so that we're doing this together, so that we're a team in protecting natural systems. So first, to start, so basically for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to roll through each of these. First is prevention. This is the most important. It's the most cost effective. It's a way of solving tomorrow's problems today before they even get started. And this is what we're talking about with the Plant Right program. Plant Right, as you, as you well understand, is focused on preventing problems from ever happening. Um, and I'm very thankful that you're all going to be, hopefully all going to be out there looking for these things. Um, and talking, talking to nursery growers and, um, and, and helping stop the spread of these things before they even get out the nursery. And there's some really good tools for doing prevention. Um, number one is that we've got really good science behind it. We have good state-of-the-art weed risk assessments that can really tell us what's going to be a problem in the future. They're like a letter from the future. Um, you can run the math on these things and you can get a list of plants that's like a letter from the future saying, please don't plant these. And you can do it a bunch of different ways. This is a greenhouse experiment done by Marcel Raymanic and Jen Erskine Ogden at UC Davis, where they basically planted a whole ton of horticultural trees under a variety of conditions and looked at what looked at the response under different conditions, and that gave them data that they needed to be able to predict which species are going to be a problem after they after after they're put out in cultivation. And we can take these data and run them and other data, including is it invasive somewhere else? and do really careful analyses and have a high probability, we can, we can predict with a very high probability what's going to be a problem. Um, and so this is a lot of the work that sustainable, sustainable conservation in the Plant Right program has led, um, figuring out what's going to be a problem in the future so that we don't even get there. Um, sometimes things get away from us anyway, and we have to have early detection and rapid response systems. We understand this to be the case in human health. We need them to protect natural systems as well. And basically, early detection uses some of the same tools. You figure out what's going to be bad in the future. You find where those things are today. You map them the way Dr. John Snow mapped cholera deaths. You prioritize and remove those most harmful ones, the biggest bang for the buck first. You show your results. You track the outcome so that you can prove your practice and so that you can show them to folks who fund and support work. You ask for more money, and then you do more of that until you're done. Simple, right? So for early detection, I'm going to focus on this a little bit more because it's something near and dear to my heart. Um, for the California Early Detection Network, we built a bunch of tools for doing early detection, um, including a series of smartphones with um, basically all California plant taxa on them that professional biologists can use to identify and map things, um, and a database that eats up any location data that we can get hold of, including stuff from smartphones where folks can manage their location and information. So I'm telling you this so that you know those tools are out there and that when you meet other professionals and other folks working in this stuff, you can let them know to get in touch with us. And then, of course, you prioritize occurrences and you go after the most important spot first and the second most important spot second, and you work on down the list. And this map right here is showing the top 50 um, eradication targets in the Bay Area for this year's project. And I'm pleased to say that all 50 are now under treatment. So we're working on this in the Bay Area and expanding across California, hoping to cover the state with a network of multi-county early detection networks to protect California from harmful invasive plants. Sometimes you can't protect everything and you've got to manage. And management is the hard part. It's messy. You can't do it without a lot of the, you, you basically it's very tough to fix something once it's broken. It takes a lot of work, a lot of resources, it's very expensive. Um, the outcome is not guaranteed. Um, it uh, can be very discouraging. It can be a lot of fun. It can be a great time to spend with your family and your friends, but it's not our, our highest calling. Mostly we just want to prevent things and eradicate them before we get to the management stage. Um, there are a lot of folks doing management. This is probably what we're all more fam most familiar with. This is where most of our resources go in dealing with biological invasions. We're pretty far down that curve. Um, we spend a lot of time managing things that we should have prevented in the first place. These are entities that are doing a really great job in California. I'm proud to partner with. Um, and then just a slide to show, you know, management is fun. This is volunteers at one of our preserves in Marin um, removing a patch of French broom. And then just to say, you know, management is messy. Um, uh, it's, it's a low consensus operation um, and um, not what we want to do. And then finally, this is not an action to, to control invasive plants or to prevent them, but it's an essential part of the solution, and that's public communication. And this is, this is basically a big value of, of the work that Plant Right and you guys are going to be doing. Um, 
the highest value is probably preventing things from getting out there. But when you're doing it, you're going to be talking to folks. You're going to be meeting folks in nurseries. And, and even though you may not be trying to do the hard sell, they're going, to, they're going to appreciate where you're coming from. And as you talk to other folks in the community, you're going to do public communication. And then you're going to be bringing that information back to the rest of us. And this is kind of the dialogue that we need so that we all understand we're doing this together. We all understand um, each other's concerns. And we can kind of move forward on some of these things and have some real solutions and protect the natural areas that we love um, from stuff like this. So there's a lot of value to it. And I'm really thankful that you're out there protect protecting places like Mount Tam from accidental escapees like this licorice plant, this helichrysum, um, and saving places that are going to be very valuable in the future. It's more than just removing weeds. It's about saving, saving, saving patterns of diversity and saving the evolutionary story of these places. When folks do climate change modeling to figure out where California's plants are going to be in the future, a lot of them need to be on Mount Tam. It's got the, as climate changes, the climate of Mount Tam um, remains suitable for a lot of these things. Unfortunately, Mount Tamalpais in Marin County is getting invaded by all kinds of plants from all over the place. And they're basically not leaving any bare dirt for those Californians to migrate and, and, and set seed on. So I'm thankful for your work. And uh, I want to give you a little bit more information. If you're interested in early detection, here's a couple websites you can go to. And if you want to get in touch with me, there's my contact info. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Glusenkamp. That was terrific. And uh, thank you to those of you who are asking questions. Uh, please keep them coming. And we will collect those and answer them at the end. Uh, so we are moving right along. Um, and I will put that website information back up again. Uh, and so what we're going to do now, actually, is take a quick intermission. So if uh, you'd like to, let's say, use the restroom or get a glass of water, whatever it may be, uh, feel free to go ahead and do that now. I'm going to put a, uh, a five-minute timer up on the screen. And so uh, you should see that. And uh, if you could please just come back and join us at the end of that five minutes, um, I will begin with the next part of the presentation. Thank you.
All right, so we have about 20 seconds left. So if you all are at your computers, if you could settle back in and get ready. All right, so uh, let's get started now. Um, during this section, I'm going to tell you more about Plant Rights Spring Nursery Survey and how you can get involved and what in involvement in this survey entails. So I'm going to spend about 25 minutes walking through this with you. And the first thing I'd like to do is tell you more about the purpose of the survey. Um, the survey is really intended for data collection. And so uh, what this will help us to do is to better understand the retail market for invasive plants in California. And uh, one of the things to note is that there are thousands of plant retailers, wholesalers, and growers in the state. And so having this information will help us to identify key leverage points through which to work with the nursery industry, and that will thereby inform our strategy. So the way that we've set the survey up is to take place from March to June, and that will cover the spring season from Southern California, let's say in San Diego County, all the way up to Northern California and into the mountains. And so we collected a list of all of the retail plant nurseries that are operating in California, and uh, from that, randomly selected 251 retail stores and uh, did this randomly in a way uh, that is proportionate to the number of nurseries that are found in each county. So we're going to be looking to collect data from more stores in, let's say, Los Angeles or Orange County than we will in, like, Alpine County, right? And so what I'd like to do is uh, take you through the steps for getting involved um, in this survey process, if you so choose. And what I'm going to do here is give you an overview of what these steps are for participating. Um, and then we'll go into each of these uh, in more detail in just a second. So the first step is to create an account on Plant Rights website. And then this next, we'll ask you to take that online quiz that I mentioned previously. Uh, next, uh, we will ask you to look for stores you would like to survey in your region or in your county and sign up for them. And then to gather the survey materials that we've created for you, that's number four, we've got a couple more here. Uh, number five is to then actually go and visit the store and collect data. Next, we'll ask you to submit this data and any pictures that you take of plants that you find at the store through our website. Um, and then the last one, number seven, is optional. Uh, and that's to give us feedback on your experience through a questionnaire that we'll distribute. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that going forward. So this is a snapshot of our website. It's www.plantright.org. And as you can see, there's that green bar or column on the left-hand side of the screen. It's a stack of tabs. And the first thing that we'll ask you to do is to create an account on our website. So if you scroll down on this page, you'll see the green bar has this user login section at the bottom. And so what we'll ask you to do is to create an account by clicking where I've circled Create New Account. So if you click there, it'll take you to this page. Um, you'll just fill in your information similar to like you did uh, to register for this webinar. So your name, your, your email address, you'll create a username and password. And then uh, after you've done that, you'll see that the green bar on the left-hand side of the screen has changed, and now it has a section dedicated to the spring survey. And so the next thing you'll want to do is take that quiz, as uh, circled here, there's that webinar quiz. So you click on that, and uh, what we've done is we've set up the quiz to have five questions. Um, four out of five correct, or five out of five correct, are considered passing. And what we've done is we've really tried to make this quiz as easy and simple as possible to pass while still requiring that you've paid attention and watched this webinar. Uh, and so this webinar is a prerequisite to participation. And I should note to all the Master Gardeners out there, um, this webinar will be eligible for continued education credit. Um, so uh, because we're really trying to make this easy, uh, if you're paying attention, I'm actually going to just go ahead and give you one of the answers to the quiz right now. Uh, so. If you're paying attention, you'll be a fifth of the way there. Um, one of the questions will be, uh, and I quote, the purpose of Plant Rights 2011 Spring Nursery Survey is two. And the answer 
is going to be the purpose of the survey is to better understand the retail market for invasive garden plants and help inform plant rights strategy going forward. So there you go, you're one fifth of the way uh, to passing. And uh, if you'd like, you can actually, if you, if you don't pass this quiz as quoted here, if, you, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. You can take this quiz as many times as you need and the webinar recording will be available on our website uh, by early next week if you'd like to review it again. So after you pass this quiz, you'll see that that green bar has changed once again. And now the spring survey section of the website has more tabs and more information that you can access. And so uh, I'm highlighting the arrow in blue. Um, I'm, I'm, it's pointing to the instructions page or that bar that says instructions. And so after you pass the quiz, you will be taken to this instructions page. And this is a snapshot of that page. Uh, and this is really set up like a set of instructions. So you can start from the top and work your way down to the bottom. And it'll take you through each step of the survey process. And so this is really going to be your best resource or your greatest resource during the survey. If you have any questions as to what to do next, you can find that answer here. And so uh, as you can see, number one, under step one, it might be a little bit tiny on your screen, but it's to review the list of nurseries to survey. Um, and so where that text is read, you will click on that, um, and that takes us to our next step of looking to find a store that you'd like to survey. So this list, this is sort of what the list will look like, um, is organized by county. And uh, if you find a store that you would like to survey, so let's just say that Home Depot there at the top in the city of Oakland, what you'll do is you'll go to the right-hand side of the screen in that column that says survey this nursery, and you will click on that. And it'll ask you to confirm, yes, you know, you do want to survey the store. And what will happen is because we have your email address through the account that you set up, an email will automatically be sent to you uh, with information about this store, and then you're ready to go. And so one of the things that we'll be asking you to do is to use your best judgment on when to visit this store. So we'd like to collect data when these stores have the most plant stock available. And that will really be, you know, at the beginning to maybe the height of spring in your region. So this could be next week if you live down in San Diego or Southern California. It could be if you live, let's say, in Lake Tahoe or up in Shasta. It could be, you know, more than a month or two from now. And so if it's going to be far enough in the future that you think, you know, it might be the case that you forget um, about the survey when that time comes around. And that could be, let's say, two months from now for some of us. It could be two weeks. It could even be, you know, tonight. Um, then uh, what I would recommend is to put a little reminder in your calendar if you think that would be helpful. And so uh, one of the things you might notice is that in some counties there are going to be more volunteers than stores. And uh, Laura, thank you for the question. Uh, the store will be removed from the list after you pick it. Um, and so one of the things that we'll suggest that you do in these situations where there are more volunteers than stores is to team up with one another. Um, oftentimes our efforts in teams can be more effective than working alone and one of the things, the pieces of feedback that we got from our volunteers last year was that they actually really enjoyed working in teams because it made this more of a social experience. Now if, um, let's say there aren't many stores to, count, to survey in the first place in your county or um, there just aren't any more left for one reason or another, the first thing that we'll recommend that you do is that you look to neighboring counties to see if there are any more stores you can help to survey there. And so if uh, this is the situation, what we're going to ask is you wait about two weeks, so let's just say about March 14th, for others that live in those counties to participate locally so that they can have the first chance to survey stores where they live. And um, because we partnered with the UC Master Gardener program on this, um, on a statewide level, uh, Pam Geisel, I just want to let all the Master Gardeners know, has given her permission for you to collect data from a neighboring region and then log it in, and, and she's asked for you to log it into the volunteer management system in the county where you normally participate. Um, now this, you know, might be available to you if you're already planning a trip to, let's say, a neighboring region or you kind of like to, uh, make an excuse, and this might be your excuse to go and visit that region. Um, and so these are the stores in blue where there are a surplus of stores, um, or where we expect that there will be more stores and volunteers. And I should note that San Diego County has probably closed that gap in the last week since I created this map. 
Um, and so here in orange is where we have more volunteers than we do stores. And so in these situations, um, I would again suggest that you team up. And if you are interested, uh, please email me and I can send you the contact information of others who have expressed interest in the survey and you can help, or you can you know, reach out to those that you would like to work with. Um, and now in yellow are the counties where because of the, st the statistical design of this survey, uh, there are few enough nurseries operating there that the survey doesn't call for us to, vault, to survey any stores there. And so um, if this is the situation, again, I would first suggest that you wait about two weeks and see if there are stores in neighboring counties that you can help to survey. And then regardless of what county you're in, if, it, if just going to another um, county, traveling to another county is just not in the cards for you. And I understand um, this really can be a long drive, um, you know, depending on where you live especially. Uh, then please contact me and I can work with you to find a solution and find a store that uh, you can survey locally and that will still contribute a lot of value to our survey efforts. So, <clears throat> these are the materials that we've created for the survey. And so once you've signed up for a store and you're ready to go and collect data, um, these are the, the, or the, the materials that you want to bring with you. So they include a set of survey instructions, a survey form, and a plant identification guide. Uh, we're asking all the volunteers who join us for the survey to print out these materials and bring them with them. Um, and the plant identific identification guide uh, there in the bottom right is really best uh, in color if that's available to you. And uh, again, if this is going to be a barrier for you um, for whatever reason, uh, please again get in touch with me and I'll have my contact information uh, posted at the end of this webinar and I will happily uh, print these materials and mail them to you. So here's a snapshot of our survey instructions. This is really uh, the same sort of thing that you saw on the website. It's the same kind of um, instruction sheet, uh, but this is set up like a checklist. So you can print this out and really just go from top to bottom and check each box as you go through the survey process. And uh, one of the things that we'll ask you to do is, um, or that I would recommend is reading through this before you go and visit the store and then uh, bring it with you as a resource while you're there. Now this is the survey form that we've created and here's where you will record all the information that you collect during the survey. And so uh, the plants are organized by growth form again, so here are those uh, grasses in the middle. And then if it's helpful to you, we've also provided an alphabetical list in the top right part of the screen. Uh, now, we'll also be asking you to just record basic information um, about the date of the survey, your name, etc. cetera, um, but I want to kind of call out this store code. Um, this is something that we're doing where we're, we're um, creating a, a code for each store so they have its own unique code um, to help to protect the identity of these stores and make sure that all the information that we collect from them is kept confidential. Uh, so that will be, the information about that will be included in the email that is sent to you uh, when you sign up for that store. And then we're also making a concerted effort to track the amount of time that volunteers uh, spend conducting the survey. So here's a little section for you to input that information there. And then uh, lastly, here is our plant ID guide. Uh, this is really to help you identify the plants based on their appearance once you're at the store. And we've included uh, these insets. Uh, and I'll show you, just, I'll pull a couple out here uh, to show that the, the plants don't always look in the stores and in their containers like they do in the wild. So you can see on the left-hand side of the screen is green fountain grass. And uh, clearly those characteristic plumes that you normally might associate with when in the wild um, haven't really matured yet. And the same can be this said for the periwinkle plant on the right hand side, or you know, it might just not be the right season for those plumes to be out. Um, and the periwinkle plant on the right hand side, the vinca major, uh, has a purple flower in the picture, but may not have that purple flower in the store. So another thing that we've done with the plant ID guide is included a uh, talking point there at the bottom in case anyone is interested in learning more about the survey, you can explain it to them using this talking point. And then at the bottom, outside of that, uh, that box, we have a reminder that this is a research-based study and it's not intended for advocacy or outreach. 
And so this kind of brings us back to the purpose of the survey, which is that it's for data collection and not for outreach. Uh, one of the things that we learned through the uh, partnership that we created with the Master Gardener program was that this is really not an appropriate role for the Master Gardeners because uh, they're tied to the state through the UC Cooperative Extension and the state has its own body that regulates the trade of invasive plants through the nursery trade uh, that are found on the California noxious weed list. And this is actually something, whether you're a master gardener or not, uh, that we support, um, sustainable conservation supports, uh, because what we found is that this kind of outreach is really most effective when it's done on an executive level. And so we found that uh, the real change happens when we meet with store executives like owners, uh, managers, or others that can help to redirect the, plant, or the store's purchasing decisions. So uh, what we'd like to do is really kindly ask um, that you please resist the urge when you're at these nurseries to reach out to the staff and conduct advocacy or outreach on our behalf. And so thank you in advance for that. And this brings us to another interesting question. Well, then what should we do in terms of interacting with store staff? Should we walk right up to them and tell them we're there at the store conducting the survey? Or should we instead put on our favorite ninja outfit and bird mask and hide behind a wall and collect information while their store's backs are turned. Well, um, if you'd like to go up to the store staff and let them know that you're there to conduct the survey, we, uh, we entirely welcome that. And here is one case where the talking point on that plant ID guide uh, may come in handy. Now, uh, another thing that we've done is we've mailed our brochures to all of the county coordinators and UC Cooperative Extension offices um, so that you can pick one of these up and bring them with you to the store so that if the store staff have any additional questions, then you can direct them to this brochure which has our website on it and suggest that they visit our website. And then afterward, um, if maybe that hasn't answered their questions, that they contact plant rights staff and we will be more than happy to answer any questions that they have. Uh, and so uh, if you are not a master gardener um, and you are not sure who your county coordinator would be, uh, feel free to contact me and I will help to put you in touch with them. Oh, and then, uh, so if you do not want to, if you don't maybe feel entirely comfortable going up to the store staff and letting them know about the survey, uh, we, you, it's, it's not necessary to do so. If you'd like to just collect the information and go on your way, we also welcome you to do that. Uh, one of the... Um, Things that we've learned through this, uh, through our executive director at Sustainable Conservation, is that she used to work in the nursery industry for Smith and Hawken, and her input was that this kind of data collection happens out, you know, all the time. Companies will send people into stores to collect uh, information, and so what we're doing really isn't anything out of the ordinary. Now, if the store does ask you not to complete the survey there, um, then please respect this request and just let us know and we can work with you to find another store that will likely be more accommodating. So, you've signed up for the store, you've, you waited for the right time of year, and now you're there, you made it. So the first thing that we would suggest you do is give yourself about a 45 minute to 90 minute window to survey the store. Now I know that's a big kind of range of time, um, and so this will really depend on the size of the store, and then the way that it is organized. And so if it's a really large store, um, I would recommend reaching out to another friend or uh, someone in your group who has watched this webinar and conducting the survey together because that can really make it go much more quickly. Um, another factor is how the store is organized. And so some stores are organized such that all the trees, all the ground covers, etc., are all in their own respective section. Others you know, may have them set up in arrangements so they're all mixed together. Um, so certainly get the lay of the land, and one thing to note is that there are going to be um, that none of the plants on our list are edible or indoor plants. It's kind of hard for indoor plants to escape into the wild, right? Uh, so you can cross those off your search entirely. And then uh, one thing to note is that uh, in most parts of California, none of the plants on our list are annuals. Now, if you live somewhere that has a particularly harsh winter, then some of the plants, like um, some of our ground covers, will become annuals because they'll die off every year. So if you live in these regions, um, certainly look through the annual section. If you live in Southern California, you can probably cross that off your list too. So you're looking through the store and you find an invasive plant. So here's a picture of highway ice plant, Carpobrotus edulis. 
And so the first thing that we'll ask you to do is to record information about this plant, any information you can find on the plant label, um, put that into the survey form, and then please take a picture of this plant. And so uh, we're asking you to bring a camera with you to the store, and this is actually really important to us. Um, we need these pictures in order to verify the data that you collect. So if we don't have any pictures, unfortunately, we can't count this data in our analysis. Um, oftentimes, plants can be mislabeled. Cultivars can vary um, based on their invasiveness. And so having these pictures really makes our results credible, which is something that's important to us. So you've collected the data. What to do next? Well, you go home. Again, you hop back online and uh, sign on to our website. And you'll see that there is a tab here at the bottom uh, that's circled now that says Submit a Survey. So uh, you'll click on that, and there will be a survey form that has fields uh, that match all of the fields in your survey, uh, the, the printable survey form. And so you'll fill in all the information that you can uh, find about it. And what we'll do is we'll collect all of the data that you submit, and by September, what we're going to we're going to synthesize that into a report, create a fact sheet, and send that out to you um, with all of the results. And so when you click submit and send us your data, uh, you will receive another email automatically, thanking you for your participation, uh, confirming that we received your results and then giving you the opportunity to provide any feedback on your experience through a questionnaire that we've created. And so we really learned a lot from this last year when we sent this questionnaire out, and uh, we truly appreciate all the comments that we get. So if you have you know, about five or so minutes, uh, we really uh, would, I guess, take to heart any comments that you have. So uh, at this stage, uh, if you are a master gardener, we'll ask you to please log your hours onto the volunteer management system or the master gardener volunteer management system. And there is a reminder in the instructions. And then, is that it? Uh, it seems like we've gone all the way through. Uh, are, we, are we done? Well, uh, I think this is the best part. If you're interested in doing another survey, I mean, you've already sat through this webinar, you've learned the process, you've gone out and you've collected the store once, and possibly become an expert on this, um, you can sign up for another store. Now, what we're going to do is ask that you sign up for one store at a time to allow everyone to participate. However, if there are a cluster of stores in a given region and you think that it would just make the most sense to go and survey them in a single trip, um, then we welcome you to do that. Uh, there was somebody who drove from Santa Cruz last year to Hollister. Um, it's about an hour and a half or more. And there were three stores in Hollister, and it would be a shame to have them go survey one, drive back, and continue doing that over and over again. So if that's the case, certainly survey or sign up for um, as many as uh, makes sense. And uh, another thing is that we're going to be trying something new this year. And uh, I just want to stop really quickly and say, Kathy, um, for submitting photos, you can do that through our survey submission form online as well. So uh, the, the, the new thing that we're doing this year is we want to highlight the successful efforts of many of the counties around California. And so uh, for those counties that survey 50% or more of the stores in their region, uh, we're going to provide a bronze designation. 75% uh, or more is silver, 100% is gold. And then if you survey all the stores, or all the stores are surveyed in your county, and there are volunteers that go and survey stores in other counties, then we will provide a platinum designation. So here's a little happy chicken with a medallion around its neck. And so we're really doing this for recognition, for recognition to thank you for your participation and for joining us in this effort. Um, and so unfortunately, in this economy, I can't actually give you gold or platinum, but we, we really do appreciate your help. So uh, we will be tracking the progress in terms of the data that we collect um, as time goes on, and we'll be creating a map of where we've received results in April and then again in May uh, so that you can uh, follow along and, and track this progress with us. So that is it for this section. Thank you all very much for uh, staying with us so far. Um, there is a question and answer period that's going to follow this, so please stay tuned. And if you have any questions, please submit them to the chat box. Um, Dan will be coming and uh, taking the helm here for a second and, and answering any questions you had during his section, and then I will come back. 
Um, the one thing that I would first like to let you know is that um, we are going to be holding off until the start of the survey period, which is March 1st, before we release the stores and allow you to sign up for them. So that will occur on March 1st at noon, and part of the reason why we're doing that is to allow those people who have signed up to join us for the Saturday webinar, which is going to be the same webinar at a different time, uh, to have a fair chance at signing up for these stores. So um, with that, uh, I believe I, we are ready for the question and answer period. Um, if any okay, of your questions of are not answered today, there is a frequently asked questions page on Plant Rights website. And in addition, um, here is both my and Dr. Dan Glusenkamp's information if you'd like to get in touch with us. So I'm going to pass it back to Dan, and uh, I believe that Matt will be uh, asking some questions. Thank you. Yep, we got a bunch of them. And uh, hopefully these first couple are uh, appropriate for Dan. Are you with us yet, Dan? Yeah. Hi. Okay. The first question comes from Nancy. She says, I heard that Mexican feather grass is being considered for the invasives list. Do you know the status of this designation? Yeah, that's an interesting plant and uh, kind of an interesting situation. Um, you're probably aware that it's, I'm not sure if it's the number one most popular landscaping plant today, but it's pretty popular. Folks are planting it all over the place. It's been on the California Department of Food and Ag's Q rating, on their Q rated list for several years, which basically, you know, is analogous to quarantine. Um, they, they let it go out for sale, but um, they're keeping an eye on it, basically. And as all of us who keep an eye on it have probably seen, it really likes to reseed. It's pretty vigorous. Um, so several years ago, um, it was the darling of, of the industry. Today, in the last couple months, there's been some discussion on like the Sunset blog, um, where folks are talking about how it's, how it's quote unquote over. Um, and uh, apparently, it's not as popular, at least among some people, as it was. It's um, still a beautiful grass, and you know it's got that blonde look that's uh, that's fairly distinctive. But it's extremely invasive. Um, it spreads where it's planted, and as gardeners, we usually don't want that. Uh, we usually want to be able to have uh, you know a bunch of different things in our garden. So as far as uh, being on lists, it's not regulated at this point. It's on the target list for the Bay Area Early Detection Network. It's one of 73 plants that we found to be very highly invasive elsewhere in the world, but limited in distribution here in the Bay Area. And that means that if we find it in the wild, we want to remove it. But we're never going to remove it from all the landscaping and everything. Um, but it looks like it's slowly kind of invading its way out of people's planting palette. OK, Dan, I think we have one more question for you, and then the rest are for Greg. Uh, Ronell asks, and pardon me if I mispronounce this, uh, this vegetation, is it vinca major and minor that is considered invasive? It's yeah, in California. Man. Yeah, in California, vinca major is is pretty invasive. Uh, it's a really aggressive ground cover. Vinca minor is not really known to be invasive to the same degree. Um, it, of course, if you have an example, well, there you go. These are plants; they got a mind of their own. Um, but uh, it's vinca major. And I saw another question where folks were referring. Um, each other to deliver samples to county ag commissioner and cooperative extension and I just want to emphasize that county ag commissioners are a fantastic resource and if you have something that you see getting out of control um, something that uh, looks like a problem uh, trust your gut take it take a collect a little sample bring it into the ag commissioner and ask them to identify it it may be nothing maybe something they know about um, it may be something that they don't know about. They send it to Sacramento. It gets identified, and, uh, and we've got an important new piece of information that the, the rest of us can be on alert for. OK, great. OK, I think these next ones are for Greg. Uh, Wave, Wave asks, are stores visited only one time? Yeah, hi, Matt, and uh, thank you for that question. Uh, stores are only going to be visited at one point. Um, it's really our preference, because of the statistical design of the survey, to have the stores on our list surveyed first. So we expect that surveying all 251 stores um, may be uh, a little bit 
of a, a challenge um, in some places more than others. And so what we'd really like is to just survey the store one time. And what we're hoping to get from the survey is really just a snapshot of the retail market. So yes, uh, just once is fine. OK, Jillian asks, how long will it take to conduct the survey once we reach the store? Right, so uh, I would recommend about 45 to 90 minutes. Uh, it could be that the store has less plant material. There are some stores that, let's say, uh, just specialize in succulents. And so we had to include them in our list because this is one of the invasive plant categories that we are interested in. And so they qualified for the survey, but at the same time, you would really only be looking for a handful of plants. So in those cases, it may take less time. Um, but I would, I would essentially, I, I would generally recommend giving about 45 to 90 minutes, and that should be sufficient. Okay, Cindy asks, may we sign up for more than one store? Right, so uh, you can sign up for one, more than one store. Um, this is one of the things that I kind of touched on later in the presentation. And actually, Matt, I should uh, let you know that I highlighted in yellow some of the questions that uh, seem to be the most relevant, uh, just kind of a lot of the questions were asked, and then uh, I touched on them later. Uh, but again, I'll just kind of go over that quickly, that yes, you can sign up for more than one store. Um, but we ask that you sign up for one at a time unless those stores happen to be clustered together, in which case, if you felt like you could survey them in a single trip, uh, that, would be, uh, that would be fine. You could just sign up for them together. OK, both Carol and Laura asked, what do the white areas on the map indicate? I think that was right around sure. 15 or so. OK, so I'll try and jump to that. Let's see if I can get it. Um, here we go. So. Uh, the white areas are essentially where it looks like the number of volunteers and the number of stores that we're interested in surveying are about the same. Uh, now, there are some counties where maybe there's only one or two stores that we're looking to survey there in the first place. And so I didn't mark this in blue because it wasn't as, uh, I guess, as dire of a situation where there were a ton of stores left to survey. Um, but those essentially are the ones where we're generally looking pretty good in terms of a balance of stores and volunteers. Okay. Kathy asks, oh, uh, you only care actually, about green? Oh, yeah. Um, can you all see the map? Okay, I'm going to see I'm, if I can go. Here we go. So, you just, how's that? You just skipped it. There it okay, is. there we go. So, uh, there's that map for any of you who are interested in seeing it again. And again, please do contact me if you live in one of the orange or yellow counties and you want to know about you know, maybe who else in your county is interested in participating or you'd like to uh, find a store that maybe isn't on our original list uh, but you, that you can help to survey um, to contribute to this effort. OK, Kathy asks, you only care about green fountain grass and not purple fountain grass. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. This is one of those cases where the cultivar does make a difference in terms of its invasiveness. And so there is going to be a reminder about this on the survey form. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, this is a, this is a good thing to, to call out. That, um, and, and a good example of why uh, we're asking you to record the cultivar name and then also take a picture of it so that we can keep track of this. OK. Annette asks, are we to talk to store personnel or do this on our own without identifying our purpose? OK, so my understanding of this question is essentially it's asking whether they should go ahead and contact the store staff and let them know that they're there to conduct the survey. Or should they instead uh, just go ahead and collect the data without mentioning anything? And, and this is something where they can, you know, you can really choose which approach you'd like to take. Uh, we welcome either. Um, and uh, I, I hope that uh, that is sufficient in answering your question. This is another thing that I, I think I, I covered for a little bit in the, in the presentation. So if you have additional questions on this, uh, feel free to ask. OK, Wave asks, what if there is no plant label? Right. And so sometimes this is going to be the case. Uh, sometimes the plant labels either aren't going to be there, or maybe they're not going to have all the information that we're looking to collect. One of the things uh, that we have a column set aside for on the survey form is looking to 
collect information on who the grower was for that plant, so who supplied that plant to the retailer. And this is really informative to us because it helps us to kind of put together a picture of what the supply chain is for these invasive plants. Now, oftentimes that information may not be there. So really collect as much information as you can as is available. And whatever uh, you know may not be there, that's fine. Um, and then in, in certain cases, let's say if there's no plant label and you're not really sure if it's the invasive plant or not, here's another situation where you could take down a couple notes on the plant, just let us know that you think that it could be, let's say, a highway ice plant and then take a picture of it, and that way we can verify one way or the other whether or not it is the plant we're looking for. Okay, great. Um, Kamala asks if you could please show the how to get involved overview slide again. Certainly. I'll get back to that. Here is the first, and then uh, I'll, I'll touch on the second again, and, and I'll just move to that next page uh, shortly. And Matt, if you want to go ahead and ask the next question, I'll just leave sure. it on this page. Okay. Um, Deborah would like to know, oftentimes ice plants don't have labels. How is it best to count them with lots of photos? Right. So uh, this is actually uh, a good follow-up to the question that Wave asked. And so uh, please, again, record all the information that you can find on these uh, ice plants and take photographs of them and submit them to us. In terms of counting them, um, this is something that is in the instruction sheet, but I'll just kind of quickly touch on it here, that uh, we're asking you to plant or to count each plant container as one unit. So if it is in a flat, that would be one plant. If it's in a, a six pack, we would count that as one plant as well. And so this allows us to standardize the counting process across volunteers. And if there's any need to differentiate between six packs and single containers and flats, et cetera, um, we'll have your pictures. And then also there's another section on the survey form where we ask you to just record uh, what container size it is. So uh, in that way, we'll be able to differentiate from one container type from another. OK, great. Um, Carol asks, can you review how we decide when to do the nursery visit in our area, stock comes in over the next few months. Do you have recommendations for different counties? Sure. So our general recommendation is that if you live in Southern California, that you probably start to go and survey stores anytime between March and April. Uh, if you live, let's say, in Central California, the time may be more appropriate, let's say, between April and May. Um, and if you live in Northern California, um, like far northern California or up in the mountains, you might want to wait, and it really depends on how the seasons transition this year. So spring may come a little bit late or it may come a little bit early, but you might want to wait if you live up in the mountains or in far northern California until uh, probably mid to late May, even possibly early June. And so uh, what I would recommend is, you know, as plant enthusiasts and garden types, uh, if you if there's, sort of, I guess, a period where you would think, well, this seems like it would be the right time to jump on going to these stores and selecting or, and, and purchasing a plant for your own garden, that might be a good time to go out and conduct the survey. And so one of the things uh, that we have learned from some of these stores, they'll bring in big batches of plants kind of at the height of, or I guess more at the beginning of spring, and then sell that stock over the course of the season. So probably going to these stores on the earlier end and the later end would be advised. Okay. Sharon asks, how long does it take to get one's login information? Sure. Um, so when you go onto the website, and I will click ahead to that slide here, uh, there is this create new account section. So what we'll ask you to do is to fill out the information in the form shown on the screen now. And once you fill that out, uh, you're, you're ready to go. Um, there should not be any delay. So once you've uh, submitted your account information, then uh, that's about how long it takes. It's pretty, uh, pretty immediate, which is nice. Now, Susanna wanted a clarification on when they can start signing up for stores. Is it March 1st at noon, or is it? earlier or later than that? 
Sure. So uh, what we've done is we've created a general, uh, or I, I should back up. We've created a list of the nurseries that we're looking to survey and just provided their general location. So the city and the county. And we've put that into a PDF on our website. So if you visit the spring nursery survey part of plantright.org, you can review that and see if there are going to be any stores in your immediate region or your area. Uh, and so in terms of learning what the exact store name and address is, uh, we will be releasing that and allowing you to sign up for them on March 1st at noon. Okay. Sharon has a question about the actual photos. Should they be in JPEG format and what megapixel size should they be? Sure. Uh, you know, they can be really in any format as long as uh, it's recognizable. We have PCs here at this office, um, but I, I don't think that, that should be an issue. Um, and in terms of the megapixel size, you know, it uh, should be clear, um, but at the same time, it doesn't need to be huge, just crisp enough for us to, to see, you know, to, to be able to define what plant it is. And our website should have the capacity to hold photos of all sizes. If it's going to be something enormous, um, then if you have the ability to maybe scale it back a little bit. But um, that's a good question, and, and, and we're pretty flexible. Barbara would like to know, are there any plans for plant right to work with the government to create laws to curb the sale of invasives? Right, and this, this is a good question just about the plant right program as a whole. And uh, this is a voluntary program. So everybody who is involved, whether you are a representative from the nursery industry, a scientist, um, a government agency, you're there volunteering um, to essentially help the nursery industry lead the way in phasing these plants out of sale and transitioning in alternative plants that are more environmentally suitable. And so this is one of the things that, you know, we've looked at. And currently, uh, the way that the California law is set up is that you cannot regulate an agricultural commodity. And uh, these nursery plants are considered an agricultural commodity. So uh, for the time being, uh, and really, because of the direction that we've taken with this plant right program, uh, we do not have any plans to work with the government to create new laws. Um, although there are existing laws, uh, like I mentioned through the California Noxious Weed List, um, whereby certain plants are regulated and are not allowed to be sold in stores. Okay, um, Julie asks, um, how can we learn more about plants that are considered invasive? Sure. Um, so. If you're looking for information about plants that are considered invasive and are also used for gardening, uh, we have a lot of information on our website, the plantright.org website, uh, that you can learn more about this. Um, there are also other websites, like there's an organization that we work pretty closely with called the California Invasive Plant Council. And so you can visit their website at, uh, and I'll actually see if I can type it in here. I'm going to pull up the whiteboard. Um, if you go to www cal-ipc.org. Uh, they have a list of all of the plants that are invasive in California. Are you seeing this? Okay. Um, here we go. Did that come up on your screen? Here we go. www.calipc.org. And uh, they also have a lot of really terrific information about what plants are invasive and then, uh, you know, how they spread, how to control them, etc. So, uh, between our website and theirs, that should be sufficient. Dan, do you have any other contributions? Okay, I'm um, getting a thumbs up. So, uh, yeah, I would check those two out first, and if you have any additional questions, of course, you can get in touch with both uh, Dan or myself, and uh, we'd be happy to help you as best we can. Okay. Um, do we have time for more questions, Craig? Yeah, so... Um, I would say let's let's ha handle or let's let's maybe uh, take a couple more questions, and then it looks like we're going to be ending uh, pretty early tonight, which is nice. Um, so we won't be keeping you too late. And what I uh, hope this provides the opportunity of is maybe um, with this extra time, if you'd like, uh, you can go on, create an account through our website, and then while the information about this webinar is still fresh in your head, uh, pa take that quiz and kind of get to that next stage of survey participation. So if, uh, if you're okay. taking off, thank you all very much for joining us. And I'll take a couple more questions, and then we'll probably shoot to end um, by about 8.30. Okay, great. Sharon asks, are we going to be worried 
about garden bugs that don't actually escape. I don't know if that's for you or different for Dan. Um, my understanding of that question would be maybe plants that are highly competitive in one's garden and would out, would I guess survive better and maybe push out neighboring plants, but at the same time might not get out into natural areas. Um, the plants that are on Plant Rights list, that uh, 19 that I showed, are the ones that we're going to be collecting information about, and those are really the most uh, most severe invaders. Um, that we have identified through the horticultural trade. And so if it's just a plant thug in one's own garden, I'm not sure if that was really the uh, full intent of the question, but uh, it probably will not be on our list, and so we won't be looking to collect information about it. Okay. Gene asks, how can I find a partner to do nursery survey with? Great question. Uh, so if there are other interested volunteers in your county who have registered for this webinar, please email me and ask uh, for their information and I can give you their names and email addresses. And if you'd like then to reach out to them and coordinate your efforts, uh, then you can do so. Okay. Um, Shannon asks, are the volunteers only those who signed up for this webinar? Uh, the volunteers uh, the way that we've set this up is this webinar is really a prerequisite for participation in the survey. And so uh, what we're doing is we are providing this webinar uh, twice live, once tonight and then again on Saturday morning. And then we will be making the webinar available for viewing from our website. So uh, if you haven't signed up for this webinar, technically you could still uh, watch it through our website online. Um, and thereby you wouldn't necessarily need to sign up. But essentially, uh, yes, the majority of people who are going to be volunteering will have also signed up for one of these webinars. So at this stage, uh, I should have all the information of people who are interested in joining us. And so if you email me, I can pass that along to you. So I'll take uh, maybe two more questions, and then we will call it a night. Okay. Um, Yvonne asks, I noticed at the bottom of the survey form, it said you count units. Each six pack counts as one, and a flat counts as one. Please clarify. Okay, uh, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, good eye. And um, so this is uh, touching on the fact that uh, we're trying to standardize the way that people count plants so that we can keep that consistent across the state. And so, uh, if you see a six plant or a six pack, let's say, of that Vinca major, um, and it's all kind of contained together please count that as one unit of that plant and mark it as such on your survey form. Okay. Oh, and actually, Matt, I'd like to answer yeah. um, Judy Huggins' question really quickly, um, which is if you I had a plant right you. login from... Okay, terrific. Um, <laughs> sorry for cutting you off then. Um, I just think sure. this is a great question. It's something that I meant to uh, cover and, and didn't, which is if you had a plant right login from last year, so if you joined us in the survey last year for the 2010 Spring Nursery Survey, is it the same this year? Um, we are going to ask you to register again um, with a new account. It can be the same username, same password, uh, but if you could just kind of go through that step one more time, we'd really appreciate it. Okay, great. And uh, Greg, I believe any questions we haven't answered, I, we can get you the chat afterwards so you can go through those and do some follow-up. Okay. Yeah, that'd be terrific. And, uh, and if I didn't get to your question, again, um, please feel free to contact me or visit our Frequently Asked Questions page on our website. And this was recorded, folks, so Greg, that's going to be available on the website eventually, right? Uh, it will be, yes. Great. Okay. Um, okay. So I thank you all for attending. Uh, this concludes our webinar. Thank you for coming on board, and uh, have a great night. All right. Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you, everybody, for joining us.